So what are the types of flavors that you're going to have for back pain and specifically just disc herniations? Well, how are they going to present? They can present with axial pain, right? So like my neck hurts, my back hurts, it doesn't really go anywhere. It's just focal in those regions. And then they can have radiculopathy. So that means just pain in the distribution of a nerve, right? So I have pain shooting in my arm. I have pain shooting down my leg. It goes down the back of my leg, goes on front of my leg. It goes on my hand, you know, and I'm going to get into the details there. Um, then they can present with neurogenic claudication. You see that primarily in the older population. As seen here in this picture, they have the shock and card sign. I lean forward and I feel a lot better. Um, then the way to consider back pain when you're evaluating these patients is it's going to come in one of these three flavors. It's going to be neck or back pain. It's going to be radiculopathy. So pain from a nerve and a distribution, or it's going to be claudication in the lumbar spine and then the neck and the neck and the cervical spine. We have some of the more dangerous. We have cervical myelopathy, right? So pressure on their spinal cord and the cervical spine, and they therefore have trouble using all four extremities at times. So what type of syndromes are you going to see and what can we attribute to a disc herniation? Well, first you can see these like red flag conditions. Okay. Um, and I'm going to just touch on a couple of those. You can have cervical lumbar radiculopathy, like we spoke about claudication or myelopathy, or just some uncomplicated back or neck pain, right? So it's again, the same three flavors. So axial pain, radiculopathy, or claudication slash cervical myelopathy. These are the red flags. So no matter what kind of field of medicine you go into, you probably should keep these just in the back of your mind, right? So call it Aquinas syndrome, which I'm going to touch on only because it is, it's not all that common, but it's something yet you cannot, you absolutely cannot miss it. Infections, another red flag to not miss. Um, metastases, somebody with unexplained uh, weight loss, a history of cancer. Um, severe progressive neurological deficit is another thing that you should not, you know, that you should work up right away. And then obviously a fracture, somebody that's at high risk. They've been using steroids for a long time. If they have osteoporosis, recent trauma, something like that. Okay, call it Aquinas syndrome. Just real quick, uh, you know, it's going to present. It doesn't always present with all of these all these findings, but they are germane to call it Aquinas. So you, you should know these. And they are limb weakness, it's typically bilateral. Um, they will have bilateral sciatica, bilateral buttock pain. They will have urinary retention. Okay, so that is classic. So a patient comes in with Claude Aquinas syndrome, they will not be able to urinate. You will be able to diagnose that with what's called a PVR, post-fluid residual. So you ask the patient to avoid, you then place a Foley catheter and you see how much urine comes out. If it's over a liter, that's basically pathognomonic. You can be confident saying, yeah, this person likely has Claude Aquinas syndrome, barring any sort of urological, frank urological issue that you completely missed. And then they'll have saddle anesthesia and they can have loss of rectal tone. And a couple of things about rectal tone, when you're out there on the wards, if, especially if you guys are third years or fourth years and you're examining these patients, your rectal exam is actually important. So there's two components to it for a neurosurgeon and neurologist and somebody that's worried about something in the spine. You want to see the voluntary anal contraction. You also want to make sure that they have deep anal pressure. So there's the sensation and the motor component. So always keep that in mind when you're evaluating to say that they don't have rectal tone is not, not as useful. And that can be very important if you're dealing with a patient with a spinal cord injury. Okay. It, you, those two findings will can change a person's prognosis potentially. All right. So enough about that. Um, the prevalence again, called aquinas is very rare, like one in three per 100,000. Okay. I've been in practice for a little bit, uh, attending for like five years and I've seen it once and it wasn't even my patient. I was helping on a call. So it's rare. Um, again, it's very, I cannot overemphasize it's rare, but super disabling. And it's worth mentioning is also a favorite of lawyers. So if you get one of these patients and you're in neurosurgery, you got to take them emergently. All right. So let's talk about lumbar radiculopathy as attributable disc herniation. Most commonly L4-5, L5-S1. Okay. That's the bottom of the lumbar spine. And what happens is there's kind of two phases, right? So you have the disc herniation and that inflammation and that irritation causes that acute, oh my gosh, my back is killing me, that, that pain. Okay. Then they have that shooting pain, shooting down their legs. And that's, that can be more longstanding. And that is from the pressure on the nerve. Okay. If there's structurally, the analogy I like to use for patients is like getting your thumb stuck in a door, right? Your thumbs in the door, it is killing you, but we take the door away. We do a surgery. It's still going to hurt a little bit. It's still swollen. So, you know, it's not, it's not something that gets better right away. Um, and it can be exacerbated with sitting, bending, walking, coughing, these types of maneuvers. And the pain is usually in a dermatomal distribution, but don't, you know, the patients don't always read the book, right? So it's a little bit more general than that. 
Um, so for example, I was just taught like, so L5 is a good one. It's going to be like the anterolateral lateral leg down to the top of their foot. And I have some, I have a better way of showing this for you uh, in a couple, a little bit, but the long and short of it is that they don't always read the book, but I will show you some tables to kind of help you systematize all of these, uh, you know, dermatomes and where this, these symptoms can arise from or how they'll present. So here's a disc herniation. Okay. So the analogy I like to use is there's a couple, first of all, I tell my patients, you know, they don't like break pads, right? They wear out over time. Okay. We're not, we don't have the same spine when we're 80 as we did when we were eight, you know, it's just, it's the way it is. Um, and what happens is these discs are filled with a jelly nucleus pulposus, right? If you're uh, taking your boards, you should remember that it is uh, the embryonic remnant of the nodal cord, just a fun fact. Um, and so the analogy I use is the jelly donut, right? So the middle is your nucleus pulposus, that's the jelly. And then the donut is the annulus fibrosis, okay? And what'll happen in a disc herniation is some of that jelly from the donut has squirted out to the outside of it. And that's what's causing the symptoms, okay? So here's a nice picture showing that, okay? So if you could see down here, over here, uh, basically, I'm gonna try to get one of these uh, yeah, markers here so you can see it. All right, so here's a nerve, okay? So it's always the same order, okay? Pedicle, root, disc, okay? Pedicle, root, disc. And so the nerve exits just below the pedicle of a like number of verte vertebral body, okay? So if I'm at L4 here, this is my L4 nerve, this is then my L5 nerve. This is what we call the exiting route. And this is what we call the traversing route. Okay. And where that disc is, is going to dictate what type of symptoms they have. So if a patient has a central disc, let's say this is L4, L5. Okay. So if this is a disc at L4, L5, well, and it's a central disc or a paracentral disc, which is what we most commonly see, then it's going to affect L5. It's going to affect the lower number, right? If, however, it's a, what we call far lateral or a foraminal disc herniation, and it's out here, it's going to affect the exiting nerve. So it's going to affect L4. Okay. And these are, it's actually very critical to remember. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward. So the nerve exits just below the, the number, the pedicle of the like number of vertebral body. And then the way I used to remember it, it is now I just see it too much to have to, I, I don't forget it, but at L4, five, okay. If it's a central disc, it's going to be five. It's going to be the lower number, right? And if it's a pyramidal disc, it's going to be higher. It's going to be able to work. Okay, let's uh, get to the next slide here. All right, so here's that table I was talking about. So lumbar radiculopathy, okay? Where's the pain going to go? And what kind of symptoms are they going to have? So for L4, you're going to look at the medial leg. So they're going to usually have pain that's going to be in the groin region, but really the medial upper leg, okay? And it's they go down to the knee and you, sometimes it'll go past the knee, but rarely. So that see what I say when patients don't re always read the book with dermatosis, it goes past the knee, but it usually doesn't for L5. It does. So L5 is going to be the anterior lateral leg, upper leg down the anterior aspect of the foot of the uh, lower leg to the top of the foot. It's classic L5. And then S1 is that classic sciatica that you hear people talking about. My, my rear end really hurts. It goes down the back of my leg to the bottom of my foot. That's classic for an L5 S1 disc. And so they are going to have deficits referable to those disc herniations. So for S1, they're going to have numbness in the bottom of their foot. They're going to have maybe a little bit of weakness with plantar flexion. For L5, they're going to have potentially weakness in extensor hallucis longus, EHL, as well as some ankle dorsal flexion. And then for L4, they might have some weakness in dorsal flexion. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention cervical. Okay. So these are cervical discs too. So we have you know, C3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7, 7, 1. Okay. And it's similar, but uh, in terms of remembering for the, as the lumbar, because what happens is now what ha the, the nerve exits above the pedicle. Okay. So it's still the lower number. So if we're at 3, 4 and you have a 3, 4 disc herniation, well, you're affecting the four nerve because the three roots already exited. It's exited above the disc. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and so if we're at three, four, it's going to be up here in the shoulder region. Five is classically the biceps. So it's a four five disc deltoid biceps are going to be affected. Six, they're always going to say I have pain right here. The six shooter, it's a way to remember it. So C five, six is going to be a C six radiculopathy. C seven is going to be the, the middle finger and the posterior lateral arm. They're going to have pain in their triceps. 
And then uh, C7, T1 as a T, C8 radiculopathy will be the ulnar aspect of the hand will be right here, okay? So just to keep in mind you know, when you're seeing these patients and evaluating them, but the approach to disc herniation is the same regardless if it's lumbar or cervical, right? We're gonna try non-operative treatment, which I'll mention. And if they have, you know, impending neurological decline or something, then yeah, then maybe surgery, which, you know, I'll address later in the talk. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.